Welcome again to Arizona Conference Camp Meeting 2021. And we are so glad you're joining us by Good News TV or YouTube or Facebook. We're glad you're with us tonight and each night that we've been doing the meeting. And tomorrow, of course, on Sabbath, we'll have another special program. It's my pr privilege to welcome each one of you. But tonight we have a very special night. Th this is the last of the... 5.30 times with uh, Ted Huskins, and we're going to bring him up in just a second. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and your blessings. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful messages you have inspired your servant, Ted Huskins, to share with us. Father, we have had comments from all over the conference and outside of the conference from different places around the country of how much they've appreciated what he's had to share. And we know that these are Holy Spirit-filled messages. They are Jesus messages, and we're so grateful for that. Tonight, as he shares with us again, we ask for your Holy Spirit to fill him, lift him, and help him to motivate us to serve you better. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we have a very special, come on up, my friend Ted. We've become friends in this short period of time that we've been together. Thank you, Carolina. And uh, Ted, we are so grateful that you have come out that we're going to give you a special gift. This is the most unique gift you'll ever get at a camp meeting uh, because we've only given it to about... 300 speakers. <laughs> this is our famous Arizona Conference cactus. Oh, wow. um, it has, believe it or not, the base is flagstone, which is a stone you can only get in Arizona, uh, from what people tell me. And we want you to remember us. So when I come to visit you at your office in Maine, I hope I see this on your desk. Absolutely. <laughs> and we want to thank so you for the wonderful ministry. That's just a sample. We want you to take a look at the real ones in here. And there's another gift for you as well you can look at later. But Thank you, Ted. God Thanks. bless you. We are so thankful for your ministry. Thank Share you with so us much. again tonight. Thank you so much, Ed. You're welcome. It is such a pleasure to be with you folks here in Arizona. And I really, really appreciate the wonderful gift and just the kindness that everyone has shown to me. You know, you folks, uh, whatever church you're a part of, you're blessed to be a part of this conference because your administrators and all the pastors that I've met and, and the office staff, they love you. And they care about God's work in this conference. And that's, that's so important. Thank you. So um, it is a pleasure to be with you again this, this afternoon. Um, we've been talking about life and how you can live an abundant life and an overcoming life. And this evening, my message is entitled, A Loving Life. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, as we open your word, we pray that you would just, again, speak to our hearts and that you would transform us from the inside out. Help us to be overcomers for you as we learn more about the ways that you want to grow us and lead us and change us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A few years ago, my union, the Atlantic Union, partnered with the Jamaica Union for evangelism. And I was asked to go to a small mountain church uh, in, in rural Jamaica and lead an evangelistic series. It was the Betheltown Church in uh, Betheltown, Jamaica. And I tell you what, uh, that was some of the most hair-raising uh, car rides I've ever had in my whole life. Um, they say that in Jamaica they average a, a fatality for every car crash. Um, it's really, really unfortunate and very sad, but the, the, there's not a lot of road signs, there's no yellow lines or white lines on the side of the road, and there are pedestrians everywhere. It was quite, uh, quite hair-raising, but um, a wonderful experience. Uh, all in all, I really, really enjoyed the church there, and it was, it was so much fun to see people coming to Jesus and, and just the exuberance and, and the passion that they had for the gospel there. While I was there, another pastor, uh, Manuel Rosario, who is a departmental director in the Greater New York Conference, he and I were hosted by Mrs. Hyacinth Brown. And Mrs. Brown is a member of the church there, and, and she had a beautiful home and hosted the two of us, and she fed us amazing Jamaican food every meal. Uh, my favorite was the green banana porridge uh, with real sugar cane that she gave us every morning. It was better than, than any dessert I've ever had. 
But the first morning that I was staying with her, I was awakened about 3 a.m. by a strange whistling sound. It was, not, it was not a sound I'd ever heard before. And I thought someone was in the house whistling very loudly. I don't know about you, but at 3 a.m., I'm not usually my sharpest. In the words of Yogi Berra, I was half awake and 90% asleep. I couldn't figure out the source of this irritating noise. And so I finally, I drifted back to sleep, only to be reawakened at 5 a.m. by the same, same noise. Well, this time I was a little more alert, and I was able to determine where the noise was coming from and what it was. And you'll never guess what it was, or maybe you will. It was a rooster. It was a rooster. Now, I grew up on a farm, and I'm somewhat familiar with chickens, but this rooster was unlike any rooster I had ever heard before. It was more of a whistle than a cock-a-doodle-doo. And so while eating my green banana porridge that morning, I said to Mrs. Brown, I said, Mrs. Brown, I'm worried about your rooster. I think his crow is broken. <laughs> and she said, oh, pastor. She said, he's okay. He's just a little boy rooster learning his job. A little boy rooster learning his job. Do you ever feel that way? Like you're a kind of a, a, an immature Christian and you're just kind of trying to still figure out what this is all about and how you can best be a, a disciple for Jesus and learn to follow him and, and be an adult Christian. I feel that way sometimes. And I've, I've been an Adventist all my life and I still feel like I'm learning and I'm still growing. Today we're going to explore what being an overcoming Christian is all about in the world in which we live. And so I have a poll for you this morning. It's a little poll or this afternoon that um, I want to ask you, and whether you're with us virtually or whether you're here in person, uh, I want you to answer the questions in your own mind, okay? And so here's the question. When you wake up, how do you wake up? Do you wake up naturally? Your body clock wakes you up at the same time every single morning. Is that how you wake up? If, if so, you can kind of put a little check mark in your mind. Or maybe your child, your pet, or your husband wakes you up every morning demanding care and attention. Is that how you wake up every morning? Or maybe you wake up to an alarm clock every morning. If you wake up to an alarm clock, whether it's your phone going off or, or one of these old-time wind-up clocks, put a little check. That would be your answer to the poll. Or maybe you're one of those people that just wakes up hard and you don't wake up until your alarm clock has gone off three times and you've thrown it across the room. Is that how you wake up? You know, we have this love-hate relationship with time, don't we? We're conscious of how precious time is and how God calls us to use it, but at the same time, we sometimes feel captive to time. Someone once said, we master our minutes or we become slaves to them. We use time or time uses us. U.S. News and World Report concluded that in a, the average lifetime, in your average lifetime, an American will spend six months sitting at stoplights. That kind of hurts, doesn't it? How about this one? Eight months of your life you will spend opening junk mail. Eight months of your life. You know, um, bless my wife, bless her to death because she's probably taken at least six of those months off of my life. She opens the mail at our house. We spend one year of our lives looking for misplaced objects, your keys, your cell phone, whatever it is that you're apt to lose, one year looking for misplaced objects. We spend two years unsuccessfully returning phone calls. Four years doing housework, five years waiting in line, and six years eating. Time. Time. As Adventist Christians, we have a special relationship with time, don't we? We're a denomination born out of an understanding of time. Our Daniel 8.14 says, unto 2,300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. We're a people living with the hope of when time will be no more and the Lord will return to take us home to heaven. And since 1844, we believe that we've been living in the time of the end. Time. 
What does time mean to you in your life? In Romans chapter 13, verse 11, Paul talks about time. If you've got your Bible with you today, look at Romans chapter 13, verse 11. If you don't, I'm going to put it on the screen for you. Romans 13, verse 11. Paul writes, besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep, for salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Paul says, knowing the time, what time is it that he's talking about? Paul, of course, isn't referring to the time of day or the day of the week. He's not referring to the fact that the Romans who are reading this letter are living in about the year 56 AD. So what's he talking about? What's the time that he's talking about? You know, in the 1960s and 70s, an idea related to the astrological age of the earth became widely accepted in pop culture. Many believed that we were living in the age of Aquarius. The idea became wildly popular among young people and hippies and counterculture revolutionaries. A band called The Fifth Dimension performed a song in 1969 entitled The Age of Aquarius. The song stayed at number one on the pop charts for six straight weeks. In some fashion, Paul is talking about the age or the eon in which his readers are living. If we read Romans in context, we quickly realize that Paul isn't just reminding them of Christ's return. He is reminding them that they are overcoming Christians, living in the age of a crucified and resurrected Savior. It is the age of salvation. It is the age of redemption. It is the age of victory. It is the age of Nikeo, of overcoming. Paul is issuing this wake-up call to his readers, and he says, knowing the time, that now it is high time that we wake up out of our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. This wake-up call, this motivation to live life in a new way as new people who are in a saving relationship with Jesus and are anticipating His return is what Paul is calling us to. What he's really saying is, is folks, the alarm is ringing, the rooster is crowing, the sun is just peeking up over the horizon, and it's time for you to get serious about living your life with Christ. So here's the question, what exactly should we be awakened to? How are we supposed to live as overcoming Christians living in the age of a resurrected and risen Savior? Look back at Romans chapter 13, verse 8. You know, the context always gives us the answer. Paul says, let no debt remain outstanding except for the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves has fulfilled the law. Whoever loves has fulfilled the law. He goes on in verse 9 to say, For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there are any other command, it briefly should be comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, because love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. A few years ago, I talked to a young pastor who was pastoring our, in our conference at that time. And he said, Ted, he said, my members are complaining. They're complaining because they say I'm not preaching present truth. They say that all I'm talking about is love. And they want me to give them present truth. It made me wonder, did the apostle, was the apostle Paul ever criticized for that? How about the Apostle John, the disciple of love? Do you think his members ever said, you know what, John, you got to quit talking about love. We have heard enough of it. We want present truth. You know what, friends? I got to tell you the truth. I don't think there's any message more relevant to end time Christianity than a message of love. There's nothing more important than that. If you want to be an overcomer, you've got to learn to love. You've got to let God's love flow through you. You know, Paul and John aren't the only ones to talk about love and about being a good neighbor. Actually, the first time this is mentioned is actually in the Old Testament. Again, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. Loving your neighbor. You know, I think even Jesus had something to say about that. Uh, this idea that you ought to love your neighbor is actually not a subtle point that Jesus made. It's not something that he just mentioned once. It's actually one of the top things that Jesus talks about. One day a religious leader asked him, he said, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And of course in Israel, they love the law. They revered the Torah, didn't they? Do we as Adventist Christians love the law? Do we love the law? If you were to ask an Adventist, what is the greatest commandment? What would a good Adventist say? What would a good Adventist say is the greatest commandment? Listen to what Jesus said when asked that question. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now that would have been considered a really good answer for a rabbi to give. And Jesus, in fact, in quoting this, was quoting the most sacred text in all of Israel. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Him shall you love with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Did you know that that was the first prayer that an Israelite child would memorize? They actually had a name for it. They called it the Shema. It is from the Hebrew word to hear. Because the first word in the text is here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And what the, what the Israelites knew and what we should remember is that there's one God and he made everything. And we should love him with everything we're worth. And so when Jesus said that, that would have been a really good rabbinical answer. And the people would have said, oh yeah, that's a good rabbi. That's a good rabbi. That's a good answer. But then Jesus does something unexpected and something very amazing. He adds an amendment to the Shema. You have to see the significance of this. What if we here at the Arizona camp meeting decided that we were going to take it upon ourselves to amend the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist church? What if we were going to add a 29th fundamental belief? Do you think Elder Wilson, the GC president, would be excited about us doing that? How about the delegates to the next GC session? Do you think they would say, oh, well, if it's good enough for Arizona, it's good enough for us. Let's do it. No matter what it is, we'll do it. You see, nobody, and I mean nobody in Israel, got to amend the Shema. It was the most sacred text in all the Torah. And yet Jesus considers himself able to amend the Shema. Why does he do that? What is he up to? You see, there's this theme in Judaism. And of course, we have to remember that Jesus was Jewish, wasn't he? He was Jewish. There's this theme in Judaism that's always present, but it's also always in danger of being lost. It is this notion that love for God and love for people are inextricably linked together. In fact, you cannot love God if you do not love other people. It's impossible. And so Jesus, in this act of breathtaking authority and absolute brilliance, weds the two concepts together in a way that we are revolutionized by and in a way that we can never, ever forget. Jesus says that love is what your life is all about. If you do not love people, you cannot love God. If you do not love people, you cannot love God. He quoted this not once, not twice, but eight times in the Gospels. Jesus is quoted as saying, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said it so often it became known as the great commandment. 2,000 years later, it's still the great commandment. And so, friends, I want you to remember that you cannot succeed at life if you fail at love. And you cannot fail at life if you succeed at love. Love is what your life is all about. If you want to be an overcoming Christian, 
The key is, is just love more. Just love more. Love people more. And so Paul says, knowing the time, it is high time that we wake up out of our sleep and we start loving our neighbors. If you have your Bibles, again, look at the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. Now, I really love Sabbath. I enjoy the Sabbath. I think the Sabbath is important. I think we should remember it and never forget it. But it's not the singular thing that should identify us. As great and wonderful and a, much a blessing as the Sabbath is, if that's the only thing that we're known for as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we're missing the boat. It's how we love each other. If we keep the Sabbath and we keep it perfectly and we share the truth of it with everybody we meet, but we don't love them, then we've missed the boat. We've missed the boat. So how are we going to love our neighbors? Let's get practical about this. First of all, notice Romans chapter 13, verse 12. Paul says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. In verse 14, he says, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, nighttime is over. It's time to get the pajamas off, get rid of your nightcap, and get dressed for daytime. And we're not going to just put on any clothes. No, we're putting on the armor of light. You know, that kind of reminds us of our baptism. In Galatians 3.27, Paul says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have put on Christ. And he goes on to say that it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek, whether you're bond or free, whether you're male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's important for us to remember because unless we realize that we are truly one, we can't love each other. You know, in ancient times when you are described as putting on a person, it meant that you were playing a character in a play. I was sitting in a doctor's office once. I was reading a magazine waiting for my, my regular annual checkup. And I was reading this article about an actor who had lost a significant amount of weight in order to play um, a character in a, in a film. And I can't remember the name of the actor, but he talked about how he read about the, the character he was playing was actually a historical figure, a true person. And he read about the character, he studied him, he looked at pictures of him. He immersed himself in that character's life so that he could properly portray him. And that's what Paul is talking about. When we put on Christ, it means that we are immersing ourselves in Jesus, that we are becoming so much like him that it, it's like he becomes us and we become him. It means we've got to start living like Jesus and loving people like Jesus loved people. It means that we've got to care about people more than we care about ourselves. And so, of course, if we're going to live like Jesus, we've got to know Jesus. We have to be so immersed in Scripture that we become like Him. The way He lives, the way He walks, the way He ate, the way He prayed become the model for our life so that we eat and pray and live and love just like Him. To love means that we only want the best for our neighbors. So we love the wealthy and we love the powerful and we love the least of these. We love the outcasts and the orphans. We love those who will never, ever love us in return. We show love to people who will never pay us back. And sometimes, you know, that's hard to do, isn't it? That's hard to do. I remember when I was in Miami, Florida, I was uh, an intern pastor. I was doing an internship at the Miami Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I was doing youth ministry, and they gave me this big RV to drive around. It was an old Winnebago. They had put Seventh-day Adventist on the side of it, and it was a health ministries van. And I had a group of half a dozen teenagers that were my, my team. 
And, and during the day, we would go to shopping centers and we would, we would set up a health fair and we would check people's blood pressure and we even had a little machine that would check them for glaucoma and, and we would talk to them about how to eat healthfully and live healthfully and, and that's what we would do during the day. At night, uh, after we ate our supper, we would pack all of these sack lunches and we would go down to Miami Beach to where the homeless lived and we would pass out sack lunches to the homeless people on Miami Beach. And, um, and, and we, we, we didn't do it very authentically, I have, to con- I have to confess, because they were dirty and they were addicts and they didn't smell great and some of them were mentally ill and we were afraid they were a little dangerous. And so we would go up to them with the sack lunch, you know, at arm's length and it was like, here you go, God bless you. And we would, you know, back up quickly. Uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a very uh, engaging way of, of ministering to them. But there was a girl in our group named Damaris. She was probably 16. And she would go up to people, these homeless guys who just stunk. They hadn't had a bath in years. And, and she would hand them their lunch. And she would come up and she would put her hand on their arm. And she would say, Jesus loves you so much, and I do too. And she would hug them. And, and, you know, I was maybe 22 years old, and I was just, I was a little bit freaked out by it. I said, Damaris, you know, these, some of these people are dangerous, and, and you're a young, pretty girl. You can't be doing that. You're going you're gonna to get hurt or something bad's going to happen. Some of these people carry knives. I said, Damaris, I wish you wouldn't touch people. And she said, Pastor Ted, she said, that's not right. She said, look at Jesus. Didn't he touch the lepers? Didn't he love people and hug people? And I said, you know what, Damaris, you're right. I said, but let's make a plan so that we can love people and be safe too. We'll go two by two. I'll go with you and and I'll hug them. And and, and if you feel like you want to hug them, you can too, but we'll be there together. And so that's what we did. And pretty soon before the summer was over, we were all hugging the homeless people. We were talking to them. They were telling us their stories. One man was a physician who got addicted to drugs and, and look where he found himself. And, and we started really ministering to people and it transformed how we approached them. And that brings me to the second point. If you're going to love people, you got to know people. You got to know people. I want you to imagine your neighborhood in your mind. Imagine your neighborhood in your mind. If you have a pen and paper, you can even sketch it out. Make a little drawing of what your neighborhood looks like. Uh, Do you live in an apartment complex? Do you live in a, a mobile home park, a subdivision? Do you live in a row of houses in town, uh, condominiums? Do you live in a rural area? Uh, What's your neighborhood look like? Who lives near you? Think about that for a few moments. Who lives near you in your neighborhood? Think about the six houses that are closest to you. If you're in an apartment complex, maybe it's the person right over you and the person right beneath you and the person beside you and right across the, the, the hallway from you. Um, who are the six people who live closest to you? Do you know their names? What else do you know about them? What do they do for work? Do they have children? Do you know what their children's names are? Do you know what grade they're in? Do you know what their hobbies are? Do you know what their problems are? Do you know what needs they have? What do you know about your neighbors? Think in your mind, how many of you know the six people, the six families that live the closest to you? Did you know that on average only 10% of Americans know the six families that live the closest to them? We used to live in a world where we knew our neighbors. We knew our neighbors. I'll confess to you, my wife and I have lived in our house for three years now. We know four of our six neighbors that are closest to us. We're doing Bible studies with two couples. Um, but we know four of our six neighbors. We've still got some work to do. We've got to, we've got to learn who the others are that are close and, and try to enter in and be a part of their world too. We all need to dedicate time and energy to meet and know the people who live around us because it's a lot harder to love a neighbor you don't know. 
And some of you are thinking, Pastor Ted, you don't know my neighbors. It's a lot easier to love them if I don't know them. There are some rough people. But I tell you what, I want to challenge you. Meet your neighbors. Meet your neighbors and really get to know them. Know the names of their children. Know the name of their pet. Find out where they work and what their hobbies are and what their fears are and what their anxieties are. And some of, some of you will find this more difficult than others. Some of us just gravitate to people. We're energized by people. We like to be around people. Whereas some of you are thinking, oh man, I'd rather shoot myself in the foot than do that. To go and talk to somebody I don't know, that's just painful. But if you're in that camp, covenant to at least find out their names and start praying for them. And pray that God will open a door of natural conversation so that you don't have to just go and cold call them on the, on the front door. To love somebody is really simple and it's really concrete. It's not mysterious. It is to will their good as God defines good. It is to want them to become their best, to be the person that God really made them to be. Because, you know, that's one of the things that God does. It's a gift God gives us. Let me illustrate it this way. Remember when you fell in love with your spouse? You thought he or she was the most wonderful, amazing thing in the world. You didn't see any of the flaws or foibles or irritating habits. None of that was evident to you, right? You just saw that they were just wonderful. You didn't see anything that, that needed improvement. My wife jokes that when I do something wrong that she has to take me back through orientation. You know, and now she says she can't possibly get rid of me because it would be too hard to train my replacement. So, but, but you know, when we're, when we're first dating, when we first are falling in love, it's, it's like there's a halo over that person and you don't see anything wrong with them. Guess what? That's how God sees us all the time. That's how God sees you. He doesn't see the things about you that are irritating. He doesn't see your sin or your brokenness. He sees the person that he created you to be. He sees the person that you're going to be in eternity. That's what God sees. And that's the gift we need to give our neighbors. We need to overlook, you know, uh, that uh, uh, their bad habits, the fact that they park their car, you know, uh, on our property or whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, I remember one house that I, I moved into, I, I, the first house I ever bought. Um, it, I bought it from the bank. It had been a foreclosed on property. And, um, you know, the grass was this high and, and it just needed a lot of renovation, a lot of work. And um, the neighbors had, had parked a junk car over on my side of the property line. It was a rural area. It was on cement blocks. And when I saw where the property boundary was, I was like, oh, no. I, said, I, I was really hoping that was their property because I don't want that. I don't want to have that discussion with them. You know what? I was, I was tempted to go say something to them the day I moved in. But by God's grace, I waited. I waited for months until I had developed a relationship with them uh, before we could talk about it. But even then when I did, it was, it was an uncomfortable conversation. Um, you know, we've got to see people as God sees people. We've got to get to know people. We've got to ask God to bless them. Ask God to give us a chance to love them. You know, Jesus taught us to pray, and his central prayer in the Lord's Prayer was, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What would it look like for God's will to be done in your neighbor's life? What would that look like? If God's will were done in the life of your neighbor, that's where your prayer should start. God, I just pray for my neighbors. I want, I want your love to flow through me and into them. Your kingdom come. God's effective will in their life. That's what God wants for your neighbor. You see, for Jesus, love was not a value. Love was the core of his, of his character. It still is the core of his character. It is the defining characteristic of the Savior that we love. For Jesus, you know, it was no coincidence that he said, love your neighbor as yourself. I am your God. Because they taught that there was a God who wanted to be loved. There was a God who loved everybody. 
In the ancient world, nobody said, Zeus is your God, therefore love your neighbor. Nobody said, Molech is your God, therefore love your neighbor. The message of Jesus begins with, you don't have to look out for yourself. Blessed are you, blessed are you, even when you mourn, blessed are you when you're poor in spirit, blessed are you who this world says are unblessed, who this world says don't have the good life. Blessed are you because there is a God who made you and a God who loves you more than you can imagine. And so no matter what happens to you, even pain, even death, nothing can separate you from the love of God, not now or in all eternity. Blessed are you. And it's out of that understanding and out of that reality that this commandment came and flowed, which would change the world. Your neighbor is so cherished by God, and that is the only foundation for human dignity that is ever really struck. Right? Why should we not steal from our neighbor? Why should we not kill our neighbor? Why should we not embezzle from our neighbor? Why do we treat people with dignity and respect? Why, why do we not want to be racist in our, our attitudes and reactions to people? All of it comes back to the great commandment. If, it, if, if God's great commandment isn't true, then none of the rest of the things in which our society is based upon have any relevance whatsoever. If we truly live in an atheistic evolutionary world, then, then it should be dog eat dog and we should all just do what's best for us and forget everybody else. But we don't want to do that because every human being matters to God. Every human being has value in God's eyes. Not because we're all equally talented or equally intelligent or equally beautiful, but because we are all equally loved. That's why when you see another human being, no matter what defects they may have, we are to love them. We are to love them because Jesus loved them. And that's where we start. John, the disciple that Jesus loved, said we love because he first loved us. Billy Graham once said that sin is the second most powerful force in the universe, for it sent Jesus to the cross. But he said, only one force is greater, and that is the love of God. That is the love of God. And so we can't give what we don't have. And so we have to start looking for small acts of service. I remember when I was pastoring in, in that same district in the mountains of North Carolina, I was pastoring the Banner Elk District. And Banner Elk is in the high mountains of western North Carolina. Mount Mitchell is there, which is the highest mountain east of the Mississippi. Uh, Grandfather Mountain was literally, uh, I drove past it every day on my way to church. Um, you know, these mile-high peaks that are on the east coast. And um, Roan Mountain was behind me. And Roan Mountain is also a 6,000-foot mountain. And we had a three-foot snow. Um, one spring, it was in March, we had this three foot snow, it was in 1998. And then immediately we had this unseasonably warm weather come in and we had torrential rains and it resulted in flooding of Roan Creek. It flooded the whole area. Uh, Bill Clinton was president at the time. He declared my county a national disaster area. They sent in FEMA and all kinds of funding. And um, we, we thought, how in the world are we going to respond to this? And, um, and so we got in our four-wheel drive pickup trucks and our work clothes, and we threw shovels in the back and, and wet dry vacs, and, and uh, uh, a couple of guys had fishing boats or canoes, and we hooked them onto the trucks, and we went looking for people. And this, and this is one house that I remember. Uh, you can actually find this picture on the web, but, but I remember that house. And we actually took a fishing boat across that, that uh, flooded area to check and see if there was anybody inside. Uh, there were some people that we rescued out of their houses and took them to safety. Uh, but mostly we, we, we uh, shoveled a lot of mud out of people's houses where the water had flowed in and brought mud with it. And we wet dry vacked a lot of people's mobile homes and, and just did a lot of good things for people. And it was a small rural community. We didn't have to tell people we were from the Seventh-day Adventist church. I knew who they were. They knew who I was. They knew I was the Adventist pastor in town. And um, they knew why we were doing it. They knew we were doing it because we wanted to be good neighbors to them. We wanted to love them. 
An interesting story, you know, um, the uh, federal government, when they sent in the funding for this, they sent in al alcohol, tobacco, and firearms agents to deliver checks to people who had been disaffected by the flooding. That was not the smartest decision. It's a, it's a rural area. It's a, an area that's very distrustful of government. And a lot of the people were either growing marijuana or they had moonshine stills uh, there in the mountains. And, and those federal agents got chased off more than once at gunpoint. And so th they didn't really, they were trying to help people. They really weren't trying to investigate people. So they had to regroup and they said, how are we going to deliver this money so that people will accept it? And they enlisted my cousin. Uh, my cousin, he's, he's not my first cousin, he's more like a third cousin, uh, but his name is Tommy Burleson, and he's the only person from that county to ever play professional basketball. He actually played for the Denver Nuggets. Uh, he was on the 72 Olympic team that uh, declined the silver medal, uh, that very controversial Olympics. But Tommy is seven foot five, and everybody in the county knows Tommy because he's unmistakable. Um, he, got, he got the height genes. I did not. Um, <clears throat> but they, they had to send Tommy door to door passing out the checks because everybody knew Tommy. Um, but, you know, when we do little acts of service, it bonds us to people. It helps us share Christ's love with them. You know, another way that you can, can learn to, to love people and meet people is to borrow things from them. You know, neighbors used to go to each other for a cup of sugar or to borrow a tool. We don't do that very much anymore, do we? We just go to the store and buy it. But what, how do you think your neighbors would react if you said, you know what, I'm baking a cake and I'm a cup short of sugar. Would you loan me a cup of sugar? And you took your measuring cup. I bet they'd give you a cup of sugar. And then that would give you an excuse to bring them a slice of cake. Uh, you know, the next, the next time you go back and visit. And then you can have a conversation with people and you get to know people. The Bible is filled with all of these wonderful practical instructions. Sometimes we kind of miss over them. The Hebrew mind was really concrete. Proverbs says, do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I will give it to you tomorrow. When you have it, give it. If you have it, lend it. Proverbs says that. The Bible says that neighbors care about belong, what belongs to each other. Again, this is just really concrete. It says, if you borrow an animal from your neighbor and it is injured or dies while the owner is not present, you must make restitution and give them a new animal. Now, in our days, how many of you borrow animals from your neighbors? Anybody here borrow a burro or an ox, you know, to plow your garden with? We don't do that so much nowadays. But what neighbors really, you know, neighbors have pets now, right? We have pets, and we love our pets. And, um, you know, maybe your neighbor would say, hey, would, would you feed my cat while I'm on vacation? You know, here's the keys to the house, and the cat food is here. Instead of saying, you know what, I don't have time to fool with your cat. No, say, I'd love to take care of your cat. Even if you're allergic to cats, say, you know what, I'll be happy to do that. You know, take care of their cat. Um, my wife is a big cat person. We have a cat. Her name is Lady Jane Gray. And one of our neighbor girls always comes and feeds our cat when we have to be out of town. She's about 10 or 11. And um, we always give her a very nice reward for, for taking care of our cat for us. And that just makes her parents love us because we're generous with their daughter and, and we trust their daughter. And those are good things to do just to help you get to know your, your, your neighbors better. This is also from the book of Proverbs. It is a sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is he who is kind to the needy. Everybody has needs. One of the ways that we despise people is by withdrawing from them. So if we're going to really follow Jesus, we can't withdraw from people. We've got to enter into their world. If you see your neighbor working on his lawnmower and he's got it turned up and he's trying to figure out what's going on or the hood's up on the car and his head's under there, if you're handy, go and say, hey, can I help you? Or maybe, you know, maybe you're not handy, but you have a set of jumper cables and, and you can still say, hey, do you need a, is your battery dead? Can I help you? Or can I drive you to the auto parts store? You know, what can I do to help you? Um, we just tend to buzz on by people and let their problems be their problems. If my neighbor has a problem, I want to make it my problem too. That's what God calls us to do. We just move towards people. 
You know, another wonderful way of getting to know people is just asking them questions. When did you move here? I just moved here. When did you move here? How long have you lived here? Did you grow up in this town? Do your parents live nearby? Um, what brought you here? What do you do for a living? Just simple questions. You can get to know people, get to know more about how they think and how they tick. If it's a couple, you might say, how did you two meet? I love that question. It's a fun question because it reminds us of when we fell in love and it always brings about interesting answers. How did you guys meet each other? In 1948, C.D. was living in East Asheville, North Carolina. His dad, or his mom and his stepdad, bought a Gulf service station in West Asheville. And they told him they were, they were going to be moving to the west side of town and that he would have to go to a new school. And so he was thinking about that. And he knew a guy that he had played football with uh, named Scat. That was literally the guy's name, like Scat Cat. And... Uh, uh, he, he, he said, hey, Scat, let's go to the movies together. I want to talk to you about the new school. And so they went to downtown Asheville. They went to the movie theater, and then they went to get something to eat. And they were talking about the school. And, and C.D. asked Scat, he said, are there any pretty girls at school? And so Scat was telling him about all the girls at school. And, and he said, in fact, he said, there's this girl, Alice. She works at the Crest Department Store during the summer. Let's go see if she's there. And so these two boys, they're, you know, 16, 17 years old. They go to Crest Department Store and they go down into the basement because Alice works at the sock counter, 1948, at the Crest Department Store. And CD is peeking around a post that's in the basement of the store and he sees the most beautiful girl he's ever seen. And he whispers to Scat, he said, does she have a boyfriend? She's bound to have a boyfriend. If she doesn't have a boyfriend, I would sure love to be her boyfriend. And, um, and Scat said, I don't know whether she has a boyfriend or not. You'll have to, you'll have to try to meet her. And, and that was CD's first memory of Alice. Her first memory of him was that, that they were sitting in class together and their last names began with the same letter. So he was sitting right behind her in class. And he, she felt a tap on the shoulder. And he said very quietly, he said, there's a button on your blouse that's undone in the back. Would you like me to button it for you? And she, she very shyly said, well, yeah, sure, please, thank you. And she remembers that he was very careful not to touch her skin with his fingers. He just buttoned her blouse very quietly and didn't say anything else. And so they, they, they struck up a conversation after class and they talked. And he said, would you mind if I came to your house and, and got to know you a little better? And she said, well, yeah, I guess you could do that. That'd be okay. And, you know, in her mind, she's thinking about her dad and her mom and how they're going to respond to that. But she said, yeah, I guess that would be okay. And he said, well, where do you live? And she only lived about a mile from where he lived. And he had a Whizzer motorbike, which is basically a Schwinn bicycle that's motorized. And uh, sometimes you have to pedal a little bit going uphill because the engine's not quite, you know, got enough steam to get you up the hill. But he rode his whizzer, and as he was riding the mile from the, from the little Gulf service station that his parents owned over to her farm where she lived, he thought to himself, if she's happy to see me, I'll stay. If she's kind of cool towards me, I'll just say hello, and I'll say I've got to get back to the station. And so he pulled up in the yard, because in western North Carolina, there's not driveways. You just pull in the yard. And uh, he pulled into the yard. And her younger sister, Margaret, was there. And uh, he said, uh, Margaret, is Alice around? And Margaret said, yeah, I'll go get her. And she ran up the hill to the barn. And uh, just a few minutes later, Alice came running down the hill. And C.D. said that he knew she was glad to see him because she was literally, she was running down the hill. And he remembers that she was wearing a green sweater and blue jeans. And two years later, they got married in August of 1950. And I know because it's my mom and dad. It's my mom and dad. And they were married for 68 years till mom passed away in 2018. And you know, when we buried her, we buried her in blue jeans and a green sweater. Because my dad said that when the resurrection comes, 
He wants her to be happy to see him again. You know, um, we need to know our neighbors. And by the way, when you're asking somebody, how did you two meet? If it's a couple and they aren't married, you don't have to say, you know, you're living in sin. You can still just say, how did you two meet? Because Jesus did not say perform behavior modification on your neighbor. He didn't say pronounce judgment on your neighbor. He just said, love your neighbor. Let the Holy Spirit take care of that stuff. Bake something, take it to their house, invite them over to watch the Phoenix Suns play, you know. If you got tickets, take them to the game. If you know somebody that has a need, you know, fulfill the need. It's fascinating to watch what Jesus can do through you as you just love people. There is a passage in the book of Leviticus that I love. It says, stand up in the presence of the aged. It's Leviticus 19.32. Stand up in the presence of the aged, show respect to the elderly, and revere your God. I am the Lord. Isn't that a great verse? Maybe there's an older person that, that lives near you in your neighborhood, and nobody ever goes to see them. Their kids have moved away. They're alone. They're lonely. And nobody is paying any attention to them. Make it your mission to know them and befriend them and love them. All of this is just tied to God. It's about how we live as stewards to the people around us. Somehow when we love the people who are most likely to be overlooked, we are loving God. Stand up in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. What a God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that awesome? It's Jesus who takes this and he sees it so clearly and he presents it so unforgettably that it opens up the whole world. The world has never been the same since Jesus came here. And you can be a part of that. You can place yourself in that flow. And why would you do that? Why would you do that? Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to be with you, that where I am, there you may be also. So let me ask you a question. Whose neighborhood are you hoping to end up in one day? Jesus is right. And when you get there, what's Jesus going to say? Is he going to say, oh, no, there's the leeches. There's Reggie and Kelly. The neighborhood has just gone to pot. No, he's not going to say that. He's going to say, welcome, neighbor. I'm so glad you folks are here. I have waited for you. I've longed for you to be here. That's what Jesus is going to say. In my Father's house are many rooms. How many? I don't know. Do you know? What I do know is that there are a lot of empty rooms, and Jesus wants to fill them. You know, friends, we struggle to get this one right. It is the hardest thing that God calls us to do, and we struggle to get it right. We struggle to love. We struggle to live as neighbors in a world where love and neighborliness is becoming increasingly rare. When I was a little boy, four years old, we moved into this house um, in the mountains of Western North Carolina in a farming community. And from my front porch or the side porch there, I could only see three other houses. It was mostly farmland around me and cow pastures. There were two houses across the road and one house kind of to the back corner. And it was, it was, as you can imagine, not a densely packed neighborhood. The road that I lived on stretched for a mile and a half from the French Broad River to the end of the road. And by the time I was eight years old, I knew everybody who lived on that mile and a half stretch. I would ride my bike up and down the road and I knew them all. There were the Youngbloods and the Moody's, the Lances, the Ledfords, the Lizenbees, the Hayes, the Gaspersons, the Mises, the Huskins. The Connors, the Deans, the Glens, the Tranthams, the Queens, the Lees, the Franklins. And at the end of the road, there was a farm that was owned by Alan and Laura Carland. When I was seven years old, Alan and Laura's son, Mark, and his wife moved back to the property and they built a house adjacent to the, the parents' house. And they had a little girl who had blonde hair and blue eyes. She was two years old when they built that house, and I remember watching them build it. I'd ride my bike up there, watching them digging the footings and, and uh, uh, watching the studs go up and the roof go on. 
Sometimes I would stop in and visit Grandma Carolyn. She'd give me RC Cola and a moon pie. And she treated me like I was her own grandchild. Um, she was just a wonderful person. And the Carlins were our best neighbors on the road. Mrs. Carlin, uh, Grandma Carlin helped my sister make a dress for the, the banquet at Academy. And, and eventually that little girl who moved into the house beside her grandparents got old enough to ride the bus. I still remember her first day of school and watching her get on the school bus with her blonde uh, hair and pigtails and ribbons on the hair. She was in Girl Scouts and sold cookies at my house. I've never had a neighbor love me like that little girl. And I got to confess to you, I've never loved a neighbor like I love that little girl. I love her so much that I proposed to her one dark rainy night halfway between her parents' house and my parents' house. You never know who lives next door. And you never know how that person may impact your life or your family's life for eternity. What time is it, friends? It's time to love. It's time to love. Ellen White says, if we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tenderhearted and full of pity, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. Love overcomes. Love overcomes. If you want to be an overcoming Christian, love like Jesus loved. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you so much that you've called us to be loving people. And that we know that we can't do that in and of ourselves. But with your love flowing through us, we can love in a mighty way, in a powerful way that impacts people's lives, not only on this earth, but for all eternity. Make us overcoming Christians who love other people. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. message and I have to say I should have if I would have known how well you were going to finish I think I would have introduced you to tonight is the dramatic conclusion of Ted Huskins uh, series but thank you that was powerful I really appreciate it and indeed we need to love like Jesus loved that's our calling I want to invite each of our viewing audience to be at our seven o'clock meeting if you're watching by the web mygoodnewstv.com or if you're watching live on uh, channel 22.1 or 44.5 please be here at seven our YouTube our Facebook and I want to encourage you tonight also to continue to send in those messages I'm getting a lot of text messages because people know me I think everybody in the world has my cell phone number but if you put them on YouTube or Facebook we have several people People who are watching those, Tony Jaspers, our pastor in Prescott, Jonathan Smith, a pastor in Tucson, and we have several who are watching that, Mike Soto. Uh, so send them on that um, YouTube or Facebook line so that we could see those and encourage those who are watching at home. We have just a small group here. Obviously, we're trying to be careful with our pandemic protocols, but we know we have literally scores of people, hundreds of people watching all over, all over the state, all over the country. And so so we're thankful you've joined us. Again, God bless you. Have a wonderful night, and we'll see you at 7 o'clock. Hi, I'm Luke Skelton, General Manager for Good News TV. It has been our honor to bring the virtual camp meeting experience to you via live stream on our website, Facebook page, and our YouTube channel. If you would like to obtain any DVDs of the powerful messages you have seen, or if you have any questions about camp meeting, please give us a call. It is the mission of Good News TV to spread the love of Jesus Christ and the truths of his word, as well as connecting viewers with a local church family. We broadcast Christ-centered messages of hope 24 hours a day on seven TV stations throughout Arizona in both English and Spanish. 
Please help us with our mission by giving generously to this ministry. To donate, please visit our website at mygoodnewstv.com or give us a call at 480-264-1116. Thank you for your participation in this year's virtual camp meeting and thank you for your prayers and support of this media outreach ministry. God bless you. I was always looking for the Lord, but uh, the mic that you saw was the mic you got. I, I wasn't, uh, you know, nice to you and then bad to you behind your back. I was always, I am what I am. I have been, you know, I have been to jail as a youngster for, uh, I would take my, I took my mom's car out for a joy ride and she wanted to make a, a, a lesson for me. I rest them, you know, and I don't blame her. Nowadays, you know, I get cards from her and says, I can't believe you turned out the way you turned out. And, and it's, it's all, you know, it's all in the background. I've always, I've never stopped listening you know, or, or the word was always in me that I, I did, I have strayed, I did stray. So yeah, I went through my times and, uh, but uh, always searching for the truth. One day my cable was cut off and I was flipping through the channels and I saw the, the good news TV and for me, it, it filled in a lot of question marks that I've always had. Like, uh, when to go, you know, when's, this, when's church? Is it Sunday, Saturday? So it is Saturday. And when I learned that, then everything else gelled together. And I, I had to be baptized. So I went through a whole uh, growing pain there and it was a good one so yeah I, I love good news TV though it's I loved it I, I would watch it till the wee hours of the morning and then go to work but yeah, I couldn't get enough you know it, it helped spread the gospel that helped me change so I guess in an indirect way, yes, it changed everything. Uh, but through the Holy Spirit in you, you can't stop the change. It, it's just, it happens. And when, when you're hit with it, you, you're hit with it. Uh, but you dive in head first, starting with baptism. You know, some of my family says, uh, don't get all Jesus crazy. I said, Mom, uh, I will get crazy for Jesus because I'll, I'll spread the news to a lot of people and some people don't want to hear it. They, they don't want to hear the stuff they, that you have to tell them. It's, if you don't want to hear the truth, you'll never reach those people. For me, I thank God that I, I, I found the Good News TV actually, but I was already down that path, but it straightened out questions for me. But th this ministry here is the, is the true blue, the real deal. And so it is, uh, it is something that I would, I would tell anybody to watch. Uh, if you want what, what I was looking for, the truth. Yeah, Good News TV, it saved my life. And, and in many ways, it changed my life. Hi, I'm Dave Lounsbury. Thank you for watching Good News TV. I'm the pastor of the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church right here in Scottsdale. Our mission as a church is to share the love of God through service, through worship, and through gospel ministry. I wanna invite you to come out and join us. We meet every Saturday at 10 o'clock for our Bible study. And then at 11 o'clock, we have our family worship service right here in our sanctuary. 
We're located on the campus of Thunderbird Adventist Academy and Thunderbird Christian Elementary. We love our association with our schools and with our kids and staff. You know, the Bible tells us that when we assemble together, there's a great blessing, that it's a time and place for encouragement, support, friendship, and enlightenment. Now, I don't know about you, but I could sure use those things today, and I bet you could too. So come on out and join us. We hope to see you soon. God bless. Many of you have been blessed by the messages from Pastor Doug Batchelor that you've seen on Good News TV. As Pastor Doug says, anyone who even glances at the end time prophecies and signs of the second coming can see that our world is literally plunging chaotically toward the end of time. Yet those who believe in scripture can live in peace through stormy times that we're experiencing because we know the end of the story. To encourage and strengthen you for the times ahead, Good News TV is offering you a free copy of the final events of Bible Prophecy magazine. It's a captivating, colorful, and biblically accurate resource that will equip you to share the good news of Jesus' soon return. From this magazine, you'll learn what the Bible really teaches about last day events, such as the rapture, the millennium, the second coming, and much more. So for your free copy, give us a call. It's time again for Arizona Camp Meeting. This is a time every year to come away for spiritual renewal, to enjoy fellowship and powerful Christ-centered messages of encouragement and hope. In past years, Good News TV has brought our viewers the camp meeting experience live from Camp Yavapines in Prescott, Arizona. This year, however, we are doing things a bit differently, which we hope will make it easier for you and your family to participate and be part of the blessing. Instead of coming up to Prescott, you can come in person to a local church near you that is downlinking our virtual camp meeting. Although we're not broadcasting the messages live on TV, you can watch on the live stream at our Good News TV website or our YouTube channel. But since fellowship is an important part of camp meeting for the whole family, we encourage you to come in person and experience it together with fellow believers. Anyone is invited to this free event. Visit our website or call us at Good News TV for a list of times and locations, some of which will also provide children's programs on site. Thank you for your prayers and your support of Good News TV as we reach Arizona for Jesus. My name is Bill Johnson. I'm 88 years old. I'm sorry to say my wife passed away approximately eight years ago. And I never was much of a TV watcher, so I have a, uh, a antenna on my TV. That's the only TV I have now. I've had for years, I've had uh, uh, satellite TV and so forth. My wife watched it all the time. I've been blessed to be able to watch uh, uh, Amazing Facts, uh, 3ABN uh, on Good News TV just with just my antenna. And I uh, ran, came across uh, uh, Doug Batchelor on uh, Amazing Facts TV. I got to watching him a whole lot and uh, became rather interested in what he has to, had to say. And then uh, I became a little more familiar with the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, through his uh, teachings and uh, preachings on uh, TV, and uh, I was I was quite impressed with the fact that everything that he said or everything that the Seventh-day Adventist Church stands for is comes right out of the Bible. It's all backed up by the Bible, and everything, including the Sabbath. Uh, that which most people don't uh, uh, honor at all is biblical. And uh, that's what really brought me uh, into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, I've, I've got to say that 
just the, the minute I walked in the door. In fact, before I walked in the door, I met a young lady out in front who was a greeter, and uh, she's become a very close and dear friend of mine, she and her husband. And uh, I walked in the doors of this church, and as soon as I walked into the foyer, I just felt right at home. Something just came over me where I, I, just, I just felt this is where I belong. And so I've been attending this church ever since. I, I, I was baptized in a, a, a Protestant church probably uh, two to three years ago. Uh, and uh, after I came to the Yuma Central, a uh, pastor here asked me if I would consider being baptized again. And I, I was also baptized uh, uh, after after I started attending this church. I've, I've been blessed to uh, be able to watch uh, Amazing Facts TV, 3ABN on Good News TV with my TV antenna. And uh, that, that has, uh, their, their programming is absolutely wonderful. There's so many uh, different uh, uh, speakers on there pastors and one thing or another that are just absolutely out of this world, then every one of them is just absolutely excellent. Hi, my name is Chandra Young. I'm the principal of Thunderbird Christian Elementary. Here at TCE, we know that every student is a child of God, and we are dedicated to inspire a love of learning and offer an academic experience that is centered around their love for their Creator at this amazing school. We encourage students to share thoughts, ask questions, and draw conclusions. TCE is a family-oriented environment with passionate teachers who love and care about God and each individual. We use hands-on activities to strengthen core concepts. Outdoor education puts students in a new environment, not just the classroom. We invite you to come see our program and be part of our Thunderbird Christian Elementary family.